Fire Call, the Fire Safety Show with Division Chief Jim Sedaris. Hi, my name is Division Chief Jim Sedaris, and you're watching Fire Call. And we're this month, we are all over Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, and we're spending some time out at the training center with a lot of different crews, and we're just going hazmat crazy out here. And we're going to get to a lot of your questions, send out some t-shirts, and Take you behind the scenes of Sioux Falls Fire Rescue to see what's the latest and greatest news that's going on with our department. Well, this first question is from Robert. Robert lives in Ber Berlin, Vermont. He's got a crazy question about fire hydrants. He wants to say, where did fire hydrants, uh, how do they become referred to sometimes as plugs? Firefighters will sometimes say, catch the plug, referring to the fire hydrant. Years ago, long time ago, before I was on the fire department, they used to have actually the pipes that would be water supply lines would be hollowed out trees. Some of those are still in some of the larger cities. They'll find these uh, water lines that were actually trees, hollowed out trees. And what they had is they literally had a plug that would have a plug every you know couple city blocks. You'd pull out the plug, the water would flow out, and you could do your bucket brigade or fill your trucks from there. So that's how fire hydrants sometimes be called fire plugs. Again, it goes way back, it's a traditional thing, and firefighters have a really long memory, and they like to go back to that kind of stuff. Got some shout outs. Now, I got a big shout out apology, and I don't normally do this, but because I mispronounced a city, Dave from Australia wanted me to make sure we got his city right. And Dave sent us a shout out from Bachnenberg, Australia. So I think I got it right. Here's email, Dave. I did my best, and the shirt is in the mail. I hope it fits you. We got a shout-out from Kyle. Kyle lives in Marinette, Wisconsin, and he wants a shout-out to the Grover Portersfield Fire Department in Wisconsin. And we hope uh, they've been watching the show a long time. This, this shout-out has been sitting around for several months. Also a shout-out to the Fort Pier Fire Department from Patrick and... Patrick lives in Fort Pierce, South Dakota. Well, I hope all you firefighters are having a good time watching our show. Need to sit back, relax, tell the kids to be quiet, turn off that Blackberry, grab some popcorn, and spend some time with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. This question is an oldie but a goodie, and it comes from Jay in Sacramento, and Jay is a retired fire chief. And he wants to know about how do we produce fire call and then serve it up on the Internet. And every month we get tons of questions, and these are all the questions we have this month coming in from Fire Call. We come into the nerve center. This is the Fire Call nerve center right here. And we uh, sit and go through all the questions, pick out the good ones, the ones we're going to use, the ones that are appropriate. Uh, sometimes we have questions that are more wintertime questions, and we'll put those off, uh, and then we sort through all our shout-outs. And I'm going to bring in our producer slash editor slash director slash knows everything about everything rich murphy and rich is the man who runs fire call so rich what do you think basically like you said we have uh, literally dozens of questions that we get every month we we come in here once a month start filtering through them all and we go through and figure out which questions we think are going to be appropriate for this show uh, if there's a theme to the show we kind of go with that other times it's just a pure question and answer show and we figure out stuff for like Fire Institute of Technology, Truck of the Month, if there's a question that revolves around sure. that. Pop quiz. Pop quiz is another good one that we love to have questions for. Um, and from there we just go out, we contact the different fire stations, see if there's who's on, who's doing what training, um, use all that kind of uh, great footage that we get from the different stations. Plus we use cover footage that I've been able to gra you know, grab over mm -hmm. the years uh, working for the city now going to all the different fires. Uh, there's a lot of great questions that we have that, you know, with the cover footage that we put over top of it, really adds to what, you know, the question is all about. And now our questions are getting, it used to be we were hoping to get one or two a month, mm -hmm. and now they're just coming in daily. So it's, it's um, a tribute to your good work as a <laughs> producer slash director slash editor slash all those other things. Exactly. And after, like I said, after we get done shooting the entire show, we try to shoot it in, usually in one day, and then we, I take it back, start doing all the editing, edit it down uh, at our station, try to get on the air actually the next day usually after we, after we shoot the show. How, how, much, how much footage do you think we shoot and then edit, edit out, would you say? Because we shoot it pretty much as live, which means Absolutely. 
we should as live meaning basically what you see is I mean it's, it's a one camera setup and very simple I mean we've had to turn the camera on myself here we don't have another videographer we don't have a you know sound man or anything it's just oh. It's, oh, people it's, are going to uh, think we do. Two microphones and a, and a camera, basically. Mm -hmm. And so it's just me behind the camera, you in front of the camera, asking the questions to the firefighters. Um, like I said, you know, when we get back and edit it, it's mostly what we've shot is what ends up on the air. Very simple. We try, And the reason we try and keep it simple is that we can turn it around very quickly that way. Sure. We can get these shows out at least, you know, about every five weeks is what we kind of hope for. And then we put them on a city website. We put it on YouTube. And we're looking at uh, another website, grouper.com, so that we can get as many people watching as we can. Exactly. We give it to our webmasters. They, they take care of it. You take care of some of the web stuff, too, yourself. And uh, try and get it out there to the masses. Great. Well, we better get back to work. Absolutely. Let's get <laughs> on to the next question. Yeah, there we go. Thanks. And thanks, Jay. This question comes from Matt in Fayetteville, Pennsylvania, and he wants to know what does RIT stand for? R-I-T. RIT teams. RIT teams stand for Rapid Intervention Teams, sometimes called RIC, Rapid Intervention Crews. What RIC teams are is they're set up to save the firefighters. If we have a building collapse, someone falls through the floor, we activate those RIT teams and they go in and rescue the firefighters. What the RIT teams have is they have all their own equipment. They have equipment so they don't have to go looking for it if something goes wrong. It's all laid out right in front of them, specialized equipment. They're all trained how to react very rapidly if we have firefighter problems, which could be firefighter falling through the floor, building collapse, any other type of emergency, they're ready to spring into action at a moment's notice. So Matt, I hope that answers your questions about RIT teams. We have three questions all kind of dealing with the same issue. The first one is from, I hope I have your name right, Lavi in Great Neck, New York. And the question is, does each rig have designating seating arrangements for all the positions, such as someone to have the irons, hydrant, pre-connects? And we also have a similar question from Brent in New Canton, Ohio, and also from Andy in Plainsville, Illinois. And they all kind of want to know, how do we staff our trucks? I have Captain Randy Farland, and Randy Farland's been on the department how many years, Randy? It's almost 17. And you're a captain. How do you run? Uh, we run four-person trucks. Correct. Uh, the driver, of course, drives the truck. And in this seat here... Front seaters? ...is where the captain sits. Okay. Um, he's... Pull on that computer screen once. We get information on this about our call that comes up on our MDC. As far as any updates in route, they'll show up on our MDC. And also the captain's job is to, uh, is to use the map book to help you know, find a hydrant once we get close if we're going to a fire and direct the driver in you know, the best way to get there. And then set up the initial command of what your Correct. initial strategy and tactics are going to be for the call? Correct. The, then, the captain's in is instant command when he, once he gets on scene. Okay. And then for the backseaters? Uh, the two firefighters sitting back here and uh, they're assigned either uh, the firefighter or, or the medic. And it doesn't matter which side they sit on. It, they're just assigned those duties for that day or for that hitch or however so they... So they, they know what they're supposed to be doing. So, it, okay, if we're going on a medical call, how does that work? The medic grabs the AED, and he's the one who has... Uh, who has patient care, and okay. the other firefighter will assist with whatever he needs, along with, depending on the call, the, the driver, the captain will assist on whatever so, he needs. So even on an EMS call, all four people have a specific task? Correct. Now we'll go to a fire. What's, how do they swap out on roles for fires? Well, one of them will be designated in the morning who's going to pull to the hydrant. If we have a, a working fire and we, and we pull a line to the hydrant, and the other firefighter knows he's going to be going in with the captain, once another truck shows up to establish or set up RIT, and we'll be ready to go in. So we don't have a bunch of confusion. Everybody knows their job, and they just snap to. Right. I mean, it's all set up, you know, either in the morning that day or most of them do it by, by month. Perfect. Well, thanks a lot, Randy, and I hope that answers all your questions on how we staff our trucks. Two great questions all about nozzles, and the first one comes from Paul in Hillsboro, North Carolina, and he wants to know, how do firefighters decide between stack tips, cellar nozzles, fog nozzles, and foam nozzles? And what are the advantages of each? Well, I have with me the guy that knows all the answers, Captain Todd Lowe. 
Uh, Todd, I see oh, you got you brought your own nozzle with you. I bought a set of stack tips with me to, <laughs> to, to show how we use the different nozzles for um, different types of fires. So explain, because explain, some people aren't going to know, what's it mean when it's stacked? Okay. When they refer to stack tips, the, the selection of the nozzle is determined upon the size of the fire and your ability to penetrate deep into the fire for, uh, to, to cool the fuel. The stack tips here, the advantages you have behind stack tips is it creates a solid stream. This solid stream has better reach and penetration to get deep into the fire um, for well burning. Usually they use them in defensive uh, fire attacks. So large master stream nozzles, large you're just going to cool it down and surround and drown basically. With stack tips here, you have the ability to control the, the determination based on the size of the tips. And as you can see, these tips, you can change them based on the size of the fire. Here's an inch and three-eighths tip. An example for this would be at the same pressure, at 80 PSI, this tip flows 502 gallons per minute. If I increase it and take, I can take each one of these tips off, at this one here, at the same pressure, 80 PSI, I can flow 1,063 gallons per minute. The determination is based on the size of the fire and the available water. And then you're going to be looking at reach is going to be different. The reach is going to be different um, based on the, the, the tips. The smaller okay. the tips, the better reach so you're going to have. So basically these all stack upon each other and it works. Now, leaving the stack tips, talk to us about, because uh, they also want to know about um, fog nozzles. What's the difference between a fog nozzle? Because a fog nozzle is like a big garden hose. You can make it wide pattern or narrow. Why isn't a straight stream on a fog nozzle the same as a solid. The advantages that you have behind a fog nozzle is that it creates a protective cover for you and it also divides your fire stream into smaller particles. It's used for interior fires when you go into a room and you're, what you do is the finer you divide the water particles, the more ability it has to absorb the heat. It turns to steam and when that steam helps us to put the fire out using less water. So now this one, obviously, you can you can change the tip, and you can see right here where. Yeah, you can change the setting on oh, this okay. here to a to what we call a straight stream, or a fog stream, and that fog stream creates a pattern um, that's wide enough, and the the wider the fog stream, the more finely divided particles you have of water. The the disadvantages you have is that. The wider the fog stream, the less reach you're going to have. But it works well for protection up close or in confined fires when you're entering a single room and contents fire. And talking about nozzles, there's another question from Amanda. Amanda lives in Sioux Falls and wants to know how do you decide between using water and foam? And talking about foam, Todd, your favorite little uh, the play air, device? The air aspirating attachment that goes on the end of our, our nozzles. And that and does it, what? What this does. Um, what this does is that as you attach the nozzle to this, this nozzle happens to clamp on right here, and as water flows through, the, through, through the end here, it pulls in air, and the more air you add to it, the thicker the foam blanket is going to be. So foam is getting pumped through the hose? Yeah, the foam comes from the truck as it's pumped through, uh, and as I get foam through here, the concentration of foam is the same whether I use this or this, but my ability to add air to it, and make a very similar to dish soap, when you add dish soap to water and you churn it up, it creates more bubbles. And we're trying to do the same thing here, is the more bubbles we can create, the thicker the foam blanket, the better ability we have to control fires. Uh, and we, when we use foam, we have two different types. We have a class A and class B foam. Class A is going to be similar to any ordinary combustible fires. We use class A for residential structure fires, and the, deter the determination between class A and B is based on the type of fire we have. So what happens when you get to, uh, now she's asking, how do you decide between water and foam? We get a big gas fire, what are we going to use? Our determination between using water and foam is the type of fire that we have. You can use foam on a class A or a residential fire, and the benefits behind that are, is that it increases surface tension, which allows the water to stay stuck to the walls a little bit better and it helps cool it down. If it's a class B fire or a gas fire, then we use class B foam and we want to produce a better foam blanket for fire suppression.
Great. Well, Todd, you've answered. Ask a short question and get a longer answer, and you've done a great job. I appreciate it, Todd. This question is all about communications, and it's from Mark in Dunham, Connecticut, and he wants to know about our two-way radio systems. Well, we're very fortunate, at Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, because every firefighter, uh, from the newest person all the way up to chief, has their own radio, and the advantage of that is we can talk right away to, to everybody on the scene, and everyone on the scene can get updates of what's going on. Uh, the radios, a lot of firefighters will carry their radios, they'll have a pocket in their coat, they might have it strapped to their gear on a, on a fire call, and everyone has their own call sign, so we can instantly talk to anybody on the scene. Works out really good. A lot of departments don't have that. They might have one radio for everyone on the truck. So it's, it makes yelling and screaming and a lot of pointing going on. We're very fortunate. Now, another question comes from Josh, and Josh lives in Chaluta, Florida, and he wants to know, back in the old days, that's probably when I started, Josh, thanks very much, if a firefighter was in trouble, the rumor was that they'd throw their helmet out the window to, to signal help. That's well, partially true, Josh. We didn't have all these radios back then. If you did get in trouble, one way to let firefighters outside the building know you were in trouble was to throw your helmet out. If you'd walk around the building and you saw a helmet on the ground, the first thing you do is you look up because it might be there on the third floor and we can get those uh, firefighters out. I haven't heard of it done recently, but back when I started, that was a pretty common thing was if you got in trouble, find a window, throw your helmet out and start yelling really loud. Back in the uh, times before the, the advanced radio communication systems, the masks we had were a little different. They weren't as dependable as they are now, and you could easily get into problems. So, Josh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, we always have to have those the stuff that happened in the old days still put back in the memory banks because you might have to use it again in a fire today. This question comes from Kevin, and Kevin lives in Sioux Falls. And he says, Jim, I've seen fire trucks scoring red lights and siren down the street and suddenly shutting them off and drive with the flow of traffic. Are they just practicing or what? Hey, Kevin, here's what's going on. They've been dispatched to a fire or an EMS call and then often were updated by Metro Communications on the radio to say maybe they can't find a patient, maybe the person's left the scene, maybe it's downgraded, the first units on the scene found out it's not a fire and they can handle it. And rather than having our trucks continue going red lights and siren, which poses a, a difficulty for traffic and puts our trucks and people at danger in an accident, they shut down and then go with the flow of the traffic. So they're not practicing, Kevin. They're just going with the flow of the traffic because it's no longer an emergency situation. We don't, our truck, we don't want our trucks running red lights and siren when they don't need to. Puts everybody at risk, puts our fire trucks at risk, our people at risk, and also puts the public. So when we're running code three, it's because it's emergency. This question comes from Chad, and Chad lives in Wildwood, Crest, New Jersey. And he wants to know about special operations. What kind of special things do we do in addition to fire rescue, and this is one of them. Hazmat's getting to be a bigger part of the fire service, and we got Captain Todd Lowe back with us to tell us kind of what's going on right here. Now, Todd, what's, what is the simulation here that, that we're doing? Today's training is on our hazmat teams, and they're, okay. they're practicing getting suiting up in the appropriate level of clothing, and they're running through what we call a decon line. The purpose of the decon line is to eliminate all potential possibilities for contamination on the, the entry personnel. So this would be that they're coming out of the hazmat call That's now. Right. They're contaminated with some type of chemical or, or some type of uh, contaminant, and this is going through the process. Now, what's with, the, what's with the, the kiddie swimming pools? Well, the purpose of the pools is that if they have a product on them, it's, a, it's the intent of, of this process is to contain the, the contaminated water because once the product goes into the, the tubs, it's contained within here, and then we pump it over to uh, a containment basement base, basin that allows us to control the product so it doesn't so run off back into the environment. What, one of our big concerns now is not only saving lives, saving property, but we really have to be concerned about the environment. You bet. Yeah, it's, and that's going to be a bigger part when we start looking at some of these contaminants that we don't know what's going to happen long term. So they go through each of these phases. Essentially, they're going through um, three different pools. And is it, is it different uh, procedures, or is it just keep just basically doing the same thing over and over to get the contaminant off? 
the purpose of the th of the three stages, and at the end, they will take personal showers to ensure that they are totally um, free from any possible contamination. Is that the first stage is 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 used to get rid of the bulk of the product, the gross decon, the growth, and as they go from one stage to the next, the contamination gets less and less until it's a point where it's safe for them to take off their protective clothing. Because we don't want to have them take off their protective clothing while still being contaminated. And this has to be done in a fairly uh, synchronized manner because they're all on air right now. That's correct. And there's a time factor to this. Um, the suits that they are wearing, is, their ability or the length of time that they spend in them suits is determined upon the amount of air that they have available. So if they run out of air, uh, the suits become ineffective and their protection is decreased. Uh, the, the tanks that they're using for on hazmat, longer duration uh, air supply tanks? Yes, they are longer duration than our standard structural firefighting and they're, SCBA. What are they rated at? One hour. But under heavy use, that gets to be more of an issue as far as well, what time-wise? They're, what they're rated at is dependent upon what their, uh, what their workload is. If they're going to do a, a lot of strenuous activity, the time could be considerably okay. less. It's their responsibility also to monitor how much air they're using and to ensure they have enough time and enough air to get through the decon line. But normally, with, normally we do a lot of the, the practicing doing the task of hazmat. We've done it on the show before where we're doing tasks. This is one of the few times that we've actually looked at deconning. Is that going to be a bigger issue now of deconning our people when they're done? It's a, yeah, it's a, a huge issue that we have to be concerned about. And it's our goal is to make sure that when they get completed with decontamination that they don't take any product back with them to the station, exchange that product between other personnel, or even bring it home to their families. Great. Well, Todd, thanks a lot. That, that answers a lot of our questions. Hope you enjoyed the show. Had a lot of cool stuff. And as hot as it is out here today, this is firehouse hot. I'd like to get one of those little uh, kitty pools myself and just hose myself off. Got a few shout-outs to wrap up the show. This shout-out, I, I want to go to this fire station. This shout-out is from Mark, and Mark's from Jacksonville Fire Department. He wants a shout-out to the Jacksonville Fire Rescue Department, Station 27, also known as the Asylum. That's where uh, I need to have my fire headquarters at. Uh, this shout-out goes to Mike from Spirit Lake, and he wants a shout-out to the Spirit Lake Volunteer Fire Department, Spirit Lake, Iowa, not too far away from here. And from Thomas in Moorhead, he wants a shout-out to the Fargo Fire Department in Fargo, North Dakota, another cold place. And our last shout-out, and this is kind of a sad shout-out, and it, uh, you know, firefighting is a very dangerous job, and we have a lot of fun here, but, you know, minute to minute, some of the people you see here might not be around, and this shout-out comes from Jeff, and Jeff lives in uh, Pleasant Hill, California. He wants a shout-out to the Contra... Costa County Fire Rescue Department in California. They just lost two firefighters uh, in a flashover during rescue operations. You know, firefighting is a very dangerous job, one of the most dangerous jobs in the country, and we really appreciate all these firefighters out there. And we send our, really our heartfelt sympathies out to California and also to the nine firefighters that died in Charleston, South Carolina. And right after we roll the credits, every month we list all the firefighters that died in the line of duty, and er every month we, we're losing a dozen or so firefighters. So uh, our hearts go out to all you guys that are doing your best. And the men and women of the fire service are some of the bravest people in the country, and we're just uh, really glad to be part of that. My name is Division Chief Jim Sedaris, and you've been watching Fire Call. <laughs>